Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Hopefully, your audio is connected and you can hear me. That's always a good start. Uh, we will go ahead and get started in just a minute. Feel free to say hello in the chat. You can introduce yourself and where you're from. Uh, it looks like we've got some chat coming in, so hopefully everything is running smoothly on your end, and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation in the ATE community by offering trainings, cultivating a community of people who care about evaluation, researching emerging topics in ATE evaluation, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out our website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on our website along with several other resources. You can also download these by following the link on the right side of your screen. The recording will be available within a couple of days and that will be emailed directly to you. I'm Samantha Hooker and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lissa wilson Betcho is our presenter today. She's the Principal Investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to recognize uh, those who work behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including Maureen Green, who you'll see in the chat with us today for technical support, Lori Wingate, Erica Sturgis, and Megan Lopez from the Evaluate team. We also want to thank Nikki Glazer Stoikoy from the New Growth Group, Elizabeth Hawthorne with Force ATE, and Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, and Emery DeWitt from Mentor Connect for their input in making this webinar. Before we get started, I do want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lissa. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, as Samantha said, my name is Lissa, and I'm excited to be here with you all today to talk about evaluation. I'm going to go ahead and turn our cameras off for the moment so you can focus on the information on the screen, but we're going to go ahead and turn the cameras back on during our question breaks. So hopefully you were able to join us in June for the first part of this webinar series, Evaluation Essentials for Non-Evaluators. As a reminder, the recordings and resources from that website are available on the Evaluate website. In case you were unable to join us, or in case June is just too far long ago to remember, I wanna to start today off with a brief recap. So evaluation is fundamentally about learning learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project. Sharing those learnings back with your funder for accountability purposes and providing evidence of the effectiveness of your project. As Samantha mentioned, this webinar is oriented to those applying to the National Science Foundation's ATE program. However, if you're coming from another context, we're glad to have you here and we hope that the information shared today is still helpful to you. So the National Science Foundation requires that all ATE projects be evaluated, not to make your lives busier, but because they truly believe in the value of evaluation. Celeste Carter, the NSF ATE program director states, if you don't evaluate and assess your activities and outcomes, then how can you know if your project was successful? Evaluation also provides the project team with data to convince others of the success of the project, as well as contributing to the body of knowledge in that particular area of STEM. I wanna go ahead and, and emphasize the first part of Celeste's sentence. If you don't evaluate, you can't know if your project was successful. And that's what we all want, right? For our projects to be successful. So the process of evaluation involves four basic steps. First, asking important questions about a project's process and outcomes. Second, gathering evidence that will help to answer those questions. Third, interpreting the data collected and answering the evaluation questions. And fourth, using those results for learning. So today we're gonna to talk about how to craft an effective evaluation plan for your proposal. So keep in mind, keep these in mind as we're gonna talk about how best to describe each step in your proposal. 
So from here on out, we're going to jump into new content. But if you have any remaining questions about evaluation or topics from the June webinar, go ahead and write them in the chat whenever you think about them, because we can make sure to tag them on the back end and we'll address them at one of our three question breaks today. So we're going to focus most of today's webinar on identifying and describing the five essential elements of an evaluation plan for NSF proposals. To get us thinking about how evaluation fits into a grant proposal, I want to start off with a poll question. So that poll question is, what percent or what proportion of our proposal should be dedicated to an evaluation plan? Do you think it should be 3%, 10%, 20% or like a third, 33%. So Samantha went ahead and launched that poll. Thank you, Samantha. And it should appear on the right side of your screen under the polls tab. I'll give you a second to respond. So I see responses slowing down a little bit. We have about 80% of our participants who have responded, so thank you. And around half of them are saying 10%. Oh, thank you, that one person that just said 3%. I, I at least appreciate a one person in each category. <laughs> well, uh, according to our reviews of NSF ATE proposals between 2011 and 2017, the average evaluation plans were actually 9% of the full proposal. So 10% is the closest in this, and most of you said that. So uh, when you're done reading the poll results, remember to click back to the chat window to bring you back to the chat. Nearly all types of NSF proposals are limited to 15 pages. The project description part of the proposal is limited to 15 pages. So as you can see on the screen, these little thumbnail images are from Evaluate's most recent funded proposal. So out of these 15 pages, 9% of that would equate to about 1.4 pages on average. So we recommend that all ATE proposals dedicate one to two pages for that evaluation plan. So this is pretty small, right? Only one to two pages, that's not a lot of space. But in these few pages, we suggest that you do the following. First, you wanna describe who is going to evaluate your project. Identify the evaluation questions. Describe how you're going to collect data to address those evaluation questions and explain how you're going to make sense of those data through analysis and interpretation. Note how information from the evaluation will be communicated and how that project will use that information. And you'll also need to convey a timeline for the evaluation. So for Evaluate's proposal, we actually included the timeline in our overall project timeline, as you can see here. So we're gonna dive into each one of these in much more details throughout this webinar, which means we're gonna be covering a lot of information today in a short amount of time. But everything we talk about today has already been summarized in our ATE evaluation plan checklist. So we hope that this resource helps you remember what we talked about today and helps you apply it to your own proposals. As a reminder, all of the resources that I talk about today are linked to in today's webinar handout, which is already available for download in the right side of your screen under the handouts tab. So let's start with what kind of information should be included about your evaluator. So NSF does like to see a specific evaluator named in the proposal who has committed to working on the project. If you're unable to identify your evaluator in your proposal, state why you cannot select an evaluator and your plans for finding an evaluator when your grant is funded. Not all NSF reviewers actually are familiar with the fact that some institutions or state policies prevent grants from co contracting with an evaluator prior to being funded. So it's best to make sure that you spell this out in your proposal. If you can name an evaluator, the next thing you wanna do is briefly describe the evaluator's qualifications and how those qualifications match with the evaluation plan for your project. So for example, if you have a highly quantitative evaluation plan, the evaluator needs to show that they have experience in quantitative evaluation. 
Then you're going to want to refer to your evaluator's bio sketch and letter of collaboration, which should be uploaded in the proposal as supplementary documents. The bio sketch should make the case that the evaluator is well matched to the project, not just that the evaluator has experience. So for those of you who are joined us in June, you may remember our friend Jen. Well, we're going to use her ATE proposal to walk through the essential elements of an evaluation plan today. But first, I want to give you a brief overview of her idea for an ATE project. So Jen teaches at a community college in an urban area that has a growing sector of food and beverage production plants. She's been hearing from her local industry contacts that they need more welding technicians with experience in sanitary standards and hygienic design for welding within stainless steel. Local companies are looking to train incumbent workers in food grade welding and will require future employees to be certified before hiring. So Jen thinks this opportunity to meet industry needs fits perfect within the ATE, NSF ATE solicitation. So she wants to embed training on sanitary welding into existing courses at her institution. Together, the new curriculum for three courses will allow students to obtain a certificate and be embedded in the associate's degree program. For these additions to be successful, Jen also knows that she will need to train current faculty and upgrade their lab equipment to give students a hands-on opportunity. So with this idea put together, the first thing that Jen did was call her procurement's office, which deals with contracts at her college. She referred to the evaluator procurement process guide that Evaluate created um, to share, to, to help her understand what this process might look like. So at other institutions, you might have to contact your purchasing department, maybe your contracts office, grants department, or even your HR office. But a good place to start if you're not quite sure is always to ask your dean. So Jen found out that her institution will allow her to name an evaluator in her proposal. So her next step was to find an evaluator. So she used Evaluate's guide to finding and selecting an evaluator to know where and how to search. Once she found a few, she conducted interviews with a few in evaluators until she found someone that was a right fit for her project. She sent them the evaluator bio sketch template so that they knew what kind of information to include in the required NSF biographical sketch. Then Jen was ready to move on to the next part in developing an evaluation plan. I'm actually going to stop here briefly just to see if there are any questions or clarifications on what we've covered so far. Samantha, have you seen any questions in the chat yet? No, no questions yet. Okay, no problem. Remember, you can add questions in the chat at any time throughout today's webinar. But for now, we'll go ahead and, oh, see, I see questions coming in. Okay, Lissa, I'm having some uh, technical difficulties with my camera, but I can't, I'm here. Uh, is it best to hire external evaluators? Yes, thank you for that question, Jen. So for those who are looking to um, put a proposal into the NSF ATE, propo NSF ATE program, it does require an independent evaluator, which isn't always the same as an external evaluator, but I think really highlights the importance of having an external evaluator or an evaluator that is separate from your project because you wanna make sure that they can provide some type of independence in their uh, assessment and inquiry into your project activities. Okay, and next, I didn't realize the evaluator needed to do the bio sketch. Yes, Kelly, it's really helpful for the evaluator to do the bio sketch. I have seen in uh, NSF review panels people really questioning how the qualifications of the evaluator matches to that of the proposal. So I think it's really important to not only provide a sense that the evaluator is qualified in evaluation, but really that they're qualified and have experience in evaluations that match the intention of that proposal. Okay, and does the evaluator only need to be external slash independent of the project or of the institution? 
great question, Adrian. So for NSF ATE, they specifically require an independent evaluator, which means that they can be internal to your institution. However, they can't have any other connections to your project. So say, for example, that person um, is uh, a project staff and is paid, has another budget line on the project, that's not considered independent. Or if the person you want to serve as the evaluator um, either supervises or is the supervisee of someone on the project, again, that's just not enough independence for, uh, for NSF to feel like that's a good, um, good idea. So in our June webinar, we actually talked about that more in depth. So if you haven't seen that section of the webinar, it might be good to check that out. Okay, and what do you recommend including in the letter of collaboration? Yes, Kandaya, thank you. Um, you know, so letters of collaboration are a little interesting in ATE. So if you read the um, PAP-G, which stands for Policies and Procedures Guide, I forget what it stands for, but it's called the PAPPG. Um, they have specific wording that they require to be in letters of collaboration. It's something fairly generic that says like, if this is funded, I agree to do the things that were talked about in this proposal. However, I've seen very often in ATE that that is stretched a bit and that people actually do want to see more details about what that collaborator will be doing. Um, and, and how they're going to engage with the project when it's funded. So you can go beyond those. I tend to kind of ride the line and include both the required uh, verbiage and something that's a little bit more specific and unique to the context. But I want to make sure that um, it's not a letter of support. So NSF used to accept letters of support, basically just saying, I think this project is a good idea, but that it, your proposal will actually be returned if you have a letter of support. So it needs to be a letter of collaboration or a letter of commitment. So um, yes, I just saw in the chat, Kelly said, did the letter of collaboration replace the letter of commitment? Uh, that's funny. I always feel like I get confused about this. And I checked right before the webinar for this exact question, but the current ATE solicitation um, talks about uh, a letter of, hold on, because I wrote it down over here. Oh, I can't find it fast enough. Um, I believe it's a letter of co commitment though, right? Because it really is talking about that action that you're going to take and not just supporting the project. Beth stated letter of commitment, so I'm going to go with that. <laughs> okay, and does the evaluator provide guidance in the proposal project? Yes, if you can work with an evaluator in that proposal development process, I think it's so beneficial for the proposal and for your project long term. Um, what you want to see as a PI and what the NSF wants to see is the real like integration of evaluation into your project, not just that it's an afterthought, but that you've really thought about how uh, the evaluation measurements will support your project goals and how you'll be able to use that information to improve your project. And, you know, evaluators just bring a really great perspective in the proposal development stage. Um, you know, they've done, they've been involved with a lot of proposals. So they think about outcomes a lot. They think about objectives a lot and goals and how best to frame these in ways that are feasible and measurable. So I think if you are able to work with an evaluator in that pre-award stage, you should absolutely engage them. Okay, and that's the last of our questions. All right, well, we'll move on to the next section. And as a reminder, we do have two more question breaks coming up. All right, well, after you um, are able, you talk about who your evaluator is, who's gonna conduct your evaluation, the next step is develop in a, I'm sorry, the next step in developing an evaluation plan is to identify the evaluation questions. So these questions serve as the foundation of your evaluation. So it's important to consider them carefully. In this section, make sure to list the key questions that the evaluation will address. These are overarching questions about the project's quality, impact, or effectiveness 
that the evaluation will answer based on evidence. So we're talking about three to seven questions, not 20 or 30 questions. And they should be about the big picture, not specific counts or measures. You wanna be sure to include questions about both project implementation and outcomes. And it's important that the evaluation is clearly aligned with the project goals and activities. So while this may seem obvious, proposal projects, uh, proposed project activities, they often change and shift throughout the proposal development process. So before submitting your final proposal, make sure to revisit the evaluation plan to confirm that the evaluation has been updated to match the activities along the way. So what makes a good evaluation question? Well, we have a few guidelines for you. First, evaluation questions should all be evaluative. So I know this sounds a bit redundant, but a non-evaluative question might ask, how many students did the project serve? This question is asking about a single data point. So if the answer to this question was say, the project served 100 students, could we determine if 100 students was good or bad? Well, not necessarily based on this question. Therefore, this question is not inherently evaluative. So if we rephrase the question to ask, what was the project's impact on program enrollment? We could determine whether the program enrollment increased, decreased, or stayed the same since the project was implemented. This type of answer is much more meaningful and more evaluative than just saying the project served 100 students. Second, good evaluation questions should be reasonable. So this means that the questions are linked to what a program can practically and realistically achieve or influence. For example, asking whether the project increased hygienic welding employment in the entire state may be un an unreasonable expectation for the project given time and resources. We want to avoid evaluation questions that are outside of the scope of resources of a project. Instead, we might ask, to what extent did students served by the project find employment in the hygienic sector? This question is more suitable to the expectations of the project. Third, a good evaluation question should be specific. So questions should clearly identify what will be investigated in the evaluation. For example, if an evaluation question asks, did the project increase instructor effectiveness? We're left asking, what is instructor effectiveness and how is it really defined? So we don't want vague questions that are stated in overly broad terms. This introduces unnecessary confusion into the evaluation. Instead, we could be more specific and ask, to what extent did participating instructors increase their knowledge about sanitary welding techniques? So this question more clearly states the expectations of the project's outcomes. Fourth, good evaluation questions should be answerable. So by this, we mean that the question should be able to be answered given accessible data and resource constraints. If we ask, for example, to what extent does the project's long-term persistence, uh, I'm sorry, to what extent does the project affect long-term persistence in STEM careers? This would require long-term tracking and follow-up with students over years, potentially decades. So this would not be feasible given a three-year ATE grant. Instead, we might focus on a more short-term outcome, such as to what extent does the project affect students' interest in pursuing a future career in STEM? It's much more feasible to answer this evaluation question within the constraints of an average ATE grant. So finally, when considering a set of evaluation questions, you want to make sure that they're complete and thoroughly addressing the purpose of the evaluation and the evaluation user's information needs. All important aspects of a project activities and intended outcomes should be addressed. Mapping evaluation questions to a logic model can help ensure completeness of your evaluation questions. If you're not already familiar, a logic model is a way of visually communicating a project's activities and outcomes. Logic models aren't required for the ATE program, but they go a, a, a long way in showing the overall design of a project and they're really useful for evaluation planning. So here are a few thumbnails of various logic models from ATE and other STEM education projects. So let's take a look at what a logic model for Jen's proposal might look like. So a basic logic model typically has the following columns across the top. 
activities. So these are what a project does, creates or delivers. And then we have short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcomes. So these are the things that uh, the, the changes that the project intends to bring about through those activities. So as we discussed before, Jen's primary activities include collaborating with local industries to understand their needs, develop content to embed in three welding courses, develop and offer professional development to faculty, and purchase new lab equipment. From these activities, a new certificate is created and faculty will gain knowledge and skills in hygienic welding. With the certificate being offered and faculty trained, we would expect to see students gaining knowledge and skills in hygienic welding. They will also gain hand... Oops. Sorry, I knocked my headset off. <laughs> they will also gain hands-on experience due to the new lab equipment and instruction activities. After engaging in the updated courses, we would expect to see incumbent workers obtain the certificate in hygienic welding and other students in the associate degree programs gaining new skills. So both of these outcomes lead to meeting industry needs around staff skills and future hiring in hygienic welding. So evaluation questions about the activities of this proposal will help a project determine whether they are achieving their targets in terms of measures such as student numbers, diversity, and satisfaction. It's also important to ask questions about project strengths and weaknesses to make sure the evaluation is gathering information that can be used by the project to enhance its quality. The evaluation should also ask questions about short-term outcomes. So what changes do you expect to see directly after the activities are carried out? To what extent has faculty knowledge of hygienic welding techniques changed? And then what, uh, and then what are the expected consequences of those changes? So here you can see kind of the logical chain to what extent, so an example question here might be, to what extent have student knowledge and skills changed? Asking about short and midterm outcomes can make a larger argument about the effectiveness of your project rather than simply asking questions about activity counts or satisfaction. It can often be difficult to adequately ask about long-term outcomes for a project. For ATE projects, these often involve students obtaining employment, uh, colleges meeting needs of local industries. For projects that are developing certificates like GENS, it might take longer than the three-year grant period for the first student to go through the program. Therefore, you might not always ask evaluation questions about long-term outcomes or impact. So as you can see, our evaluation questions now span most of the columns of our logic model asking questions about both implementation and outcomes. So in your evaluation, you want to make the strongest argument possible about the effectiveness of your project. So really consider what types of information would convince you as a scientist whether the project has been successful or not. So I know that we covered uh, all of this pretty fast, but Evaluate has a number of resources on logic models and evaluation questions that can help you put this into practice. So first we have a logic model template for ATE projects, which includes question prompts and examples. We also have a webinar recording that focuses solely on how to integrate a logic model into your funding proposal. And the recording slides and additional resources from that webinar are available on our website. And if you wanna learn more information about what makes a good evaluation question, see the evaluation questions checklist which really provides a more detailed definition of the criteria for good evaluation questions that we discussed earlier. All right, so we're gonna stop here for another question break to see if there's any questions you have lingering. Do you suggest including benchmark and indicators of success, AKA target numbers? Yes, Candaya, we're actually going to talk about that in the next section. So I'm going to say, let's hold on to that question. Samantha, I don't know if there's any way to kind of like unmark that question. So we, maybe we can come back to it the next question break. I think I can. Okay, thank you. Does the logic model go in the appendix? Great question, Kelly. Um, so NSF reviewers do not need to read anything in supplementary documents per se. They're not required to. So 
if you don't put a logic model in the 15 page project description, people might not see it, people might not read it. So our suggestion is typically to put it in those 15 pages of the project description, because that way you know that it's being seen, it's being read, it's being considered in those reviews. And you know, I'll say I've talked to a number of reviewers and they really appreciate having that logic model there. Um, think about you're sitting on a review panel and you have maybe 10 proposals that you need to read all 15 pages longer with the supplementary documents and having that visual that succinctly summarizes the project activities and intended outcomes can be a really helpful touchstone for them to not only um, remember the details of your proposal, but really use it in that discussion. Okay. In terms of the design of questions, are there any guidelines that give uh, sample sub-questions related to the more broad question? Mm. Yes, Mohammed. So I like to think of evaluation as very hierarchical. So you kind of have these broad evaluation questions. And so again, those are the those big picture questions. But often we need to break those down, right? So if you're gonna say something like, to what extent has student knowledge changed? you know there's lots of ways that you can measure that so we're going to talk about it in the data section in a little bit but to say that you can break each of those questions down into whether you want to call them sub questions right so maybe it's knowledge about a specific content area um, maybe you're using a specific uh, assessment exam that you you want to measure but you can have those sub questions or sometimes they're called criteria that break that up but i just want to make sure that you're being um, specific in those evaluation questions, right? That you're not getting so macro level that an external reader would say, I'm not quite sure what they're measuring here or why. And Mohammed did ask a follow-up and he said particular, particularly in the case of OECD criteria. Oh. Yes. Um, so Mohammed, can you remember, remind me what OECD stands for? Because I'm pretty sure you're talking about the DOC criteria. Is that correct? Well, I put him on the spot and now he has to respond in the chat. <laughs> yes. Yep. So uh, DOC criteria are really talking about in an international development context. And so a lot of international evaluations use these specific criteria um, and they're actually very um, prescriptive. So uh, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know it includes like sustainability and it's been a second. So I don't know them off the top of my head, but um, most evaluations will, they actually use, instead of a logic model, they use what's called a log frame. And you'll very often see those very specific criteria um, linked to evaluation questions with indicators of how you're gonna measure each of those. Okay, and how do evaluation questions differ from analytic questions? Hmm. I think that's a really um, good point. I'm going to rephrase this a little bit for some of oh, our and Lisa, audience. Can I to jump say, in and just say there is a follow up asking, please. and how do we link them? Oh, mm -hmm. and how do we link them? Thank you for adding that, Samantha. Um, I'm going to rephrase this question a little bit to, to also say, you know, we get asked the question how do evaluation questions differ from research questions? Um, and often we, there's this maxim that says, um, research answers the questions of what is, um, and evaluation answers questions of so what. So I think this actually links to Kandaya's question earlier about benchmarks and standards. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit in the next section, but um, evaluation questions are inherently evaluative. They have something that allows you to say, is this good or bad? Whereas analytic questions are typically just describing a phenomenon. They, they are putting those counts, those descriptive statistics or even inferential statistics out there, but not making um, any type of value statement of saying like, is this project doing um, well or is it not doing well? Is it meeting its, its goals, its standards, um, its objectives or not? So that's really where the evaluation comes in. So the other question of how are they linked? Um, there is this really great study by Dana Linnell, and she talks about the difference between evaluation and research using these overlapping 
circles, these Venn diagrams. So there is uh, this overlap between evaluation questions and analytic questions, absolutely, particularly when it comes to methods used. Um, and, and we see in some NSF programs that they actually do require both. They require an evaluator and like an educational researcher, right? So in those types of programs, we're really having that conversation of where's the overlap, where's the distinction. And so for me, I just always want to come back to the project should learn from an evaluation, right? That the project should be able to act on evaluation findings or do something different because of evaluation findings. Um, so I think that that idea of, of standards and that interpretation of the data in order to answer the question in a meaningful way is really what makes those two different. Instead of having short-term, mid-term, long-term, can there just be one column showing deliverables? So there is no one single right or wrong uh, way to do a logic model, right? In the end, it is just a tool for you to clearly explain your project's intended activities, deliverables, and impact. Um, one reason that I would encourage you to really think about at least splitting up short term and maybe long term is because those might be fairly different, right? And particularly within that NSF context, you want to make sure that you're speaking to that broader criteria of um, that larger criteria of, of broader impacts, right? So what's this broader impact? What's the change to society that your project is going to bring about? Um, and so that doesn't always come across very clearly if you're just talking about short-term impacts. And being able to split them out into different columns allows the reader to really see that through line, kind of like that timeline and the assumptions of what comes first and what comes next. Okay, and beside, beside the DAC criteria, are there other evaluation criteria to pay attention to, especially for development interventions? Um, so I am not an expert in monitoring and evaluation in international development context, I want to say that first, but really the DOC criteria are the ones that come to mind for me immediately. But depending on who your funder is, so if you're with the United Nations or um, funded by USAID or the World Bank or, um, you know, any of those uh, uh, groups, some of them actually do have specific criteria that they will ask you in that request for proposals. Um, so make sure you pay attention to that. Um, but I think criteria are always going to be context dependent. And for any evaluation, I think the most important thing is to center what the people involved really want to learn. And those people could include the funders, like we were saying. So in an ATE context, that funder is NSF. But it's also the project staff, right? It's people who are carrying out the activities. What do you want to learn? What do you need to know about in order to do your project better? And then another perspective you might want to consider is the participants. So this could be the students. This could be the community that the project is serving. Um, it could be faculty. But you know, what do they want to know? You know, when we talk about criteria, a lot of times we talk about what needs to be measured to know what's good. So what do they think needs to be measured? OK, thank you, Lisa. And we are all set for this break. All right, I think we have one more, but we have a number of information to get through first. So let's go on to that. So the next element of an evaluation plan is really about data for the evaluation. So what information will be used and how it'll be collected, analyzed, and interpreted. So these things are all distinct, but we've grouped them together in this section because we can't really talk about one without referring to the others. So in this section, you want to describe what information will be used to answer the evaluation questions. So these are indicators. How the information will be obtained and from what sources. So these are data collection methods how the quantitative and qualitative data will be summarized, so here's the analysis, and how the findings will be used to answer the evaluation question. So this is where that interpretation piece comes in. So let's take a closer look at each of those terms. So indicators are the specific things you will measure so that you're, you can answer the evaluation question. 
So examples might be the number of educators served, students' interest in STEM, or rates of program completion. Data collection methods is how the information for the evaluation will be obtained. Data collection methods might include surveys, interviews, focus groups, or using existing student data. Analysis is the process of transforming that raw data into usable information. So this might include identifying themes and qualitative data, producing descriptive statistics like means or percentages, or significance testing. So although they're often conflated, analysis is not the same thing as interpretation. So interpretation is what you do so you can actually answer the evaluation question. To make meaning out of that data analysis generally involves comparing findings to another group, a prior year or maybe a benchmark or a goal. So here's where we go back to Candaya's question about should you include some type of standard or benchmark? And my answer here is yes, because here's where you're making that differentiation between the analysis, those analytic findings, and the interpretation, an evaluative finding. Because what you want to do is make meaningful evaluative conclusions that can help the project determine whether or not they're meeting their goals, whether or not something isn't going so well, or whether or not something can continue to be improved. So let's take a look at Jen's first draft describing her evaluation data. So go ahead and take a few minutes to read the excerpt on the screen and consider whether you see evidence of those four elements that we just talked about. Indicators, data collection methods, analysis, and interpretation. And then you can go ahead and use the chat box to the right side of your screen to share your thoughts on whether or not this description is adequate. So I'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and read it. All right, so I see one response in the chat from Monica. And Monica says, you know, this is too general, that some of the text could be plopped into any grant proposal for any project. Yeah, yeah, and Jennifer says, it's a description of a process, not addressing the product. Uh, Raymond says, it feels like it's missing the analysis and the interpretation portions. They don't seem to be there. I see some agreements with Monica. Yeah, again, no indicators are given. Right. So as you, you've all pointed out, this is kind of vague. Um, and this description could describe a whole host of evaluation plans. There's no evidence that this evaluation has been tailored to the activities or the goals of GEMS project. And you know, I think we see this far too often. There's certainly a balance to be struck of how much detail should be put in in the pre-award stage versus how much can be filled out at the post-award stage, but you wanna remember how it's gonna come across to the reviewers of the NSF panel. You need to put enough information in there that they have faith, they trust that this evaluation will come out with useful um, data, useful information for that project. So, now you might be thinking this is a lot of information to include for just one part of a one to two page evaluation plan. And you're right, you probably won't have a lot of room to go in depth like we just mentioned, but you do want to demonstrate that there is a concrete plan for collecting and using the evaluation data. So a particularly efficient way to present the data um, could be in a table like this one. So uh, I think tables and matrices are particularly useful um, to evaluators. But here in this one, you'll see across the top, we have the evaluation question. 
And then in that first column, we have the indicators that will go ahead and answer those, that evaluation question. And then we have the data sources and methods for each indicator, along with the analysis and the interpretation for each indicator. So as you might imagine, using this format, it really forces us to think carefully about the data that we'll collect and how we'll get it and how we're gonna use it. So using a matrix format like this can really help to strengthen your evaluation plan and show the logical connections between your indicators, data sources, analysis, and interpretation. So if you want to put your data collection plan into a table like this, we do have some guidance for you in our evaluation data matrix template. So this template includes definitions and examples for each component of an evaluation data matrix. In the next section of your evaluation plan, you need to briefly touch on communication and use of the information from the evaluation. So here you should identify what reports will be prepared and who will receive them. At minimum, you should have at least one annual evaluation report in advance of, your, of the annual report that's due to NSF to ensure that you can really integrate those evaluation findings. It's good to mention how frequently the evaluator will communicate with the project team to show that there's that real feedback loop there. So for the evaluate team, we meet with our evaluators about once a month. Also note how evaluation results will be shared with external audiences who could benefit from this information. So these are checkpoints that are embedded in the NSF's review criteria. One, is the evaluation likely to produce useful information to the project and others? And two, will the project evaluation inform others through the communication of results? So make sure to demonstrate that this is going to happen in your proposal. A strong evaluation plan is correlated with higher scores from NSF reviewers. For the sake of time, I'm actually going to go ahead and skip this question, but just know that it's, these examples are written in the slides that you have access to um, download on the handouts tab. Um, but here the question was to, to talk about which description of evaluation, communication, and use you think is best. But if you're not sure what communication should look like between the project team and the evaluator, check out our communication plan checklist. We also has a, have a checklist of different ways that you can use your evaluation findings. It can be really helpful to have these options in mind when you're in the writing, the proposal development stage. It really allows you to envision how you're gonna get the most out of your evaluation. Finally, you need to convey a timeline for the evaluation. You need to identify when key evaluation activities will take place and show that there's a concrete plan for getting timely information from an evaluation. Again, a matrix is a great way to do this. So by key activities, I mean things like major data collection points, reporting, um, and when you're gonna meet with your evaluator. So you can include your evaluation timeline in the evaluation plan section or along with the overall timeline for the project, as you can see we did here. So here's an overview of those five elements that we've been talking about that you need to include in your ATE evaluation plan. Identify an evaluator, list evaluation questions, discuss your evaluation data, how those findings will be communicated and used, and a timeline of evaluation activities. So to help you present the evaluation plan succinctly within a proposal, we've created an evaluation plan template, which will show you how to organize the information effectively. So I suggest that you use this along with the evaluation plan checklist. They go well together. There are a few other places that you'll want to integrate evaluation into your ATE proposal. So let's look at some of those. So there are four other places beyond the evaluation plan section where information related to the evaluation should show up. So the first is called the results from prior NSF support, which is only relevant if you've had prior NSF funding. So this section is within your project description. So it's within those 15 pages, but not necessarily within the two, one to two pages for the evaluation plan. In this section is where you're going to describe your previous project's outcomes. Reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work that is related to your current proposal. 
So as a reminder, the review criteria for all NSF proposals include intellectual merit, which is about the advancement of knowledge and broader impacts, which is, I'm sorry, <laughs> I strung those together. So the review criteria include intellectual merit, which is about the advancement of knowledge, and two, broader impacts, which is the benefit to society. So next, you'll need to integrate information about your evaluation into the project budget and budget justification. You may recall from June's webinar that funds to support an independent evaluator are required by the ATE solicitation, and that these funds must match the scope of the proposed evaluation activities. We talked about budgets in detail last month, but a good rule of thumb is to plan on spending around 10% of a project's direct budget on evaluation. This may decrease for smaller projects and increase for bigger projects. When it comes to the budget justification, there are a few aspects you want to make sure to include. So according to the NSF's Proposal and Award Policies and Procedure Guide, see, I had it written somewhere in here, commonly referred to as the PAPG, there are three main items you'll want to address. First, identify the hourly rate of pay for the evaluator. Second, justify the time required for evaluation activities. Again, this should match the timeline and evaluation activities discussed in the evaluation plan section. Finally, outline the evaluator's main tasks and deliverables. The important part is that these items are reasonable and justified. So make sure these numbers don't seem to be pulled out of thin air, but that they really have reasoning behind them. All NSF proposals also require a data management plan. So this is another place you'll want to integrate information about your evaluation. This document can be up to two pages and must include the following. The types of data or material that will be generated by the project, the format that data will be in, policies for accessing and sharing the data, policies for the use of the data by others, and plans for archiving and preserving access to the data. The point here is that when each of these items refer to data, they're also talking about evaluation data. So make sure to include evaluation data when writing up your data management plan. Finally, all proposals should have references. So I should mention that the budget, budget justification, data management plan, and references, these are all separate from your 15-page project description. So here you want to include up-to-date and relevant references to evaluation literature um, in your project. I'm sorry. Uh, you want to include up-to-date relevant re references to evaluation. And doing this in your project description can really help to show the evaluation is grounded in and building on current knowledge and practice. If you're going to use a specific evaluation approach or instrument, provide citations to support its use in your context. So there's no page limit to the reference cited document, but you should also only include references that you mention in your project description and that are pertinent to your work. So just as the details of your evaluation plan should align with your proposal goals and activities, information about your evaluation should be integrated into various sections of your proposal beyond just the evaluation plan. Reviewers like to see that the evaluation plan is intentionally integrated into project activities, not just an afterthought. So I know we've covered a lot of information today and it can be overwhelming when developing a proposal. So before we head into our final question break, let's look at some next steps you should take. Oops. I already showed you the step, I guess. So first, if you're able, find an evaluator whose qualifications match your project needs. Next, it's helpful to have a clear sense of your project's activities and intended outcomes with the creation of a logic model. Once that's drafted, review the required information for an evaluation plan with our evaluation plan checklist. So this checklist really summarizes the essential elements of an ATE evaluation plan and other sections of your proposal to integrate evaluation, like we've done today. Finally, we recognize that writing an evaluation plan can be a heavy lift. So Evaluate offers free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in developing evaluation plans. 
anyone can take advantage of our ATE evaluation coaching, but I've seen it be particularly useful for those writing ATE proposals who can't contract with an evaluator in the pre-award stage. So you can read more information or request a meeting with one of our wonderful coaches on our website. And finally, I want to mention that we actually have an upcoming web chat next Tuesday, August 15th. Um, and it's focused on finding and hiring an evaluator. So if that's what stage you're at, um, register, come join us. It's an informal conversation for an hour in which you can hear tips from Evaluate, but also hear from your peers about what they've done, um, what successes and challenges they've experienced. All right, so we're gonna stop here for our final question break. Okay, Lissa, could you share the author that you mentioned when you were talking about the difference between research and evaluation? I can. I can actually do you one better. I looked up their paper. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Gold star. <laughs> okay, um, are the results from prior NSF funding separate from your 15-page report as well? They are not. So all proposals in which you have received, uh, anyone on the co-PI um, list, uh, PI or co-PI, if they've received prior NSF funding that's related to what's being proposed in that current proposal, you actually need to, to start off your section, start off your project description with a section called prior NSF funding. Um, and actually, we have a really good checklist for what to include in that section. So I would really suggest going to check that out. Um, I think a frequent mistake that I, I see there and I've heard there is that people really just kind of regurgitate the activities that they did before. Um, but the intent of that section is to demonstrate that not only can you successfully carry out those activities, but that you achieved your intended goals, that you um, you really actualize the outcomes that you were hoping for. And so being able to demonstrate those evidence of impact really gives the reviewers and, and NSF in general um, more trust that you know you can do it again. So that section is, is pretty important to make sure that you're integrating evaluation findings from your prior projects. Oh, and she asked where it is. It should be in the handout, but if it's not, um, we'll find it. Maureen, could you check on that, please? Communicating results with outside audience is an interesting topic since it's dependent on the PI support, approval, and interest. How do you recommend addressing this? Yes. Uh, a successful evaluation is always a collaboration between the evaluation team and the project team. Um, sometimes I hear project staff PIs or project staff who just feel that evaluation is entirely in the hands of the evaluator. Uh, but that's not true. Like Kendai is pointing out, particularly when it comes to that dissemination piece, um, most evaluators, most evaluation contracts, at the end of the day, the findings and the report belong to the project. So your evaluator, the evaluator of a project won't share that outside of the project without explicit permission to do so. And so I think it's really important to make sure that PIs and project staff truly understand the value of evaluation, not only to their project, but also in sharing those findings to other projects. Um, sometimes we hear a hesitation of, well, this says something not so positive, but at the end of the day, you know, you can't really fail, right? Like it's just learning. If something didn't work, you learned what didn't work. And sometimes that's more important than learning what did work because then someone else at another institution, another state, another ATE project can really learn from what didn't work from you or what did work from you. And then that's how you're advancing these larger initiatives across the country. Okay, that is the last of our questions. Well, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Samantha to close us out. But before I do that, I do want to say, if you have additional questions or want to continue the conversation, please feel free to reach out to us. 
Okay, and we acknowledge this is a lot of information to digest, but of course, that's what we're funded for. So please don't hesitate to reach out with any of your questions. We hope that we can be a source of knowledge and community for you as you move forward with your potential projects. And as we close today, please take a few minutes to take our feedback survey. We really do value your input and we use the responses to these webinars to improve our future webinars and evaluation training activities. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. I truly appreciate your engagement and your presence here. I did see the question in the chat again if this webinar was recorded. And just a final reminder, it is being recorded and it will be shared with everyone who attended and registered. Um, so look out for those materials in your inbox. Please take a few minutes to do our feedback survey. Um, we really do look at it and use it. It is a part of our evaluation. So we really appreciate any feedback suggestions you can give us. Thank you so much.